Good morning, church. Thank you guys for being here on this awesome, awesome morning. I wish we could be together, but we find ourselves here again recording in the Ice House, and um, I'm, I'm looking forward to the day where we get back together, uh, sing together, get to shake your hand, get to hug you guys. But for now, this is where we are, um, so we're just going to ask you to sing together with us. You can stand with us in your house, um, get together as a family, and, and worship together. Let's, let's get started. Reaching out to welcome you, God. Fill this place again with your song. Flood our thoughts with wonder and awe. Give us a great glimpse of a never-changing God. All we want, cause all we want and all we need is found in you, found in you, Jesus. Every victory is found in you, found in you. Open wide, wide our hearts. 
hearts now to yours every fear bow down to your love if we would see like never before Give us a greater glimpse of a never-changing God. All we want, cause all we want and all we need is found in you, found in you, Jesus. Every victory is found in you, found in you. Your presence there's freedom cause in your presence there is freedom and in your presence we are made whole cause in your presence there is freedom presence we are made whole cause all we want and all we need is found in you found in you Jesus every victory is found in you found in you all we want and all we need found in you found in you jesus every victory is found in you found in you There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning well, I know I will never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me, there was another in the waters, holding back the sea. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in the fire. All my dead left for dead beneath the waters well, I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore And should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way I won't bow to the things of this world I know I know I will never be alone There is another in the fire Standing next to me There is another in the waters Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding The power set me free There is a grave that holds nobody now that power lives in me There is another in the fire Whoa. There is another in the fire Whoa. Like 
can see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him i can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where sin i can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls came in nothing stands between us nothing stands between us there's no other name but the name that is jesus let's sing that together There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. He who was and still is will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. I know. I know I will never be alone There is another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the seas Should I ever need remind me How good you've been to me I count the joy come every battle I know that's where you'll be I can see I can see the light In the darkness As the darkness bows to Him I can hear the roar In the heavens As the space between where thin I can feel the ground Shake beneath us As the prison walls came in Nothing stands between us Nothing stands between another in the fire Standing next to me There'll be another in the waters Holding back the sea And should I ever need remind How good you've been to me I count the joy come every back Cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every bad Cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every bad Cause I know that's where you'll be I count the joy come every bad Cause I know that's where you'll be Amen Again, so glad you guys are here with us. Um, at this point in our service, we typically have you guys greet each other, but of course we can't do that. Um, but I would love for you guys to let us know you're here in the comments below. Also, um, one of the things I'm looking forward to is being able to go to a restaurant. I'm a homebody. I typically eat food at home. But I'm looking forward to going to a restaurant. So in, in the comments below, let us know uh, what restaurant you're looking forward to uh, to go to once they open all back up. I'm looking forward to going to this Indian restaurant in Greeley. It's a teal building. I can't even pronounce it. I don't know what it is, but it's amazing. So let us know in the comments below what restaurant you guys are looking forward to uh, to eat at once things open back up. Thank you. Henry, I just want to tell you how proud I am of you, and I've seen uh, Jesus working in your heart for a while now. Why do you want to get baptized? Because I want to walk with Jesus. I want to know that after this life, I will walk with him forever, and that I will always be by his side. Henry, I want you to repeat after me and take your confession, then I'll have your dad. Dad, Chris, you want to baptize him? Sure. sure? Okay. So, uh, I want you to repeat after me. I believe, I believe Jesus is the Christ. And I commit my life to him as Lord and Savior. And I commit my life to him as Lord and Savior. And we all said? Amen. 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 Now it's not warm anymore. Yeah, it's not warm anymore. <laughs> I got cold on the way over. All right, and so your dad's going to baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That you're walking with Jesus, you have someone else 
in your life to lead you. Good morning, church. It is so good to be with you. Hope you and your family had a great uh, week. Uh, the clip that you just watched before our bumper into our brand new series, which I'm going to talk about in just a moment, was a clip from our baptism on Easter Sunday. If you didn't join us or weren't with us on Easter Sunday, at the very end of my message, uh, we challenged people, hey, if today you want to confess Jesus as your Lord and Savior and put him on in baptism, uh, we made that available. And it was one of the most fun experiences I as a pastor have ever had. We filled up our tank that we normally have available in service, and we put it in the back of Caleb's truck, and uh, Henry Jones uh, made the good confession for Christ and was baptized, and it was one of my favorite moments in ministry, so uh, we're so excited about that. If you are interested uh, in being baptized or have questions about baptisms, uh, please let me know. Uh, anyone on my team, our staff, we would love to talk to you about that, and uh, that is something that's uh, one of the ordinances of the church that we participate in and we believe is an important part part of your walk in faith and trust with Jesus. Now today we're going to be begin a brand new series called Anxious for Nothing. And I think the timing on this series is spot on and God knew in advance that this is the message series that we needed to have right out of Easter. Now, I do all the planning about a year in advance, and so last September, I wrote out all of the sermon series. What are we going to be looking at for the entire year? And because of God's goodness, and He knows what we need in times like this, we're going to do this series called Anxious for Nothing. Now, I want to ask you a couple of questions. Are you anxious about anything right now? Are you anxious about your health? Are you anxious about the health of someone that you love? By this point and uh, where we're at in this COVID-19, you probably either know of uh, someone that has had the, the virus, or maybe you even know of someone that has passed from the virus. And so because of uh, this virus that is going around, we can be anxious about things in the area of health. What about the area of finances? Are you anxious about your finances? Of all the prayer requests that I've received over the last four weeks, the number one prayer request is, Pastor, my spouse lost his or her job. Pastor, my hours have been cut in half. Can you pray that God uh, provides and gives provisions that I'm going to need to make it over these next few weeks and months? Maybe you've been anxious about your children's education. We've now moved online. Our, <clears throat> our uh, school district has done an amazing job. Uh, with preparing us for that. But what if, what if this is going to be the new norm for us, that education is going to move online next fall and the kids maybe not are back in school? Maybe you're anxious about what is the new norm going to look like? For most of us, probably including you, you're like, I just want it to go back to normal, the way it was. But what if it never goes back to the way it was? Unfortunately, we don't know everything that is in our future, but guess who does? God does. He knows everything. He's not surprised by the coronavirus. He's not surprised this season we're in. And uh, today I want to look at a passage in Philippians chapter 4. So open up your Bible there, Philippians chapter 4, and we're going to be in chapter 4 starting in verse uh, 4 through 7. But before we get to that, what I'd like to do is just give you a little historical content of what's going on here uh, with uh, this book, the, this letter that's written by uh, the Apostle Paul to the church at Philippi. And so uh, I want you to know he adores this church. He writes this letter. It's really a letter of joy and encouragement to the church who is in the midst of some crisis. And also Paul writes this uh, from a Roman prison and he is awaiting his verdict if guilty or innocent. So I want you to imagine, do you think Paul's struggling or dealing with any kind of anxiousness? He's in a jail cell, probably chained to the walls, chained to a floor 
and he's awaiting a verdict, guilty or not guilty. I am sure that he may be just a little bit struggling with some anxiousness or anxiety. So we're going to pick this up, and we're going to start in verse uh, 4 of chapter 4 and through verse 7. It says this, Always be full of joy in the Lord, and I say it again, rejoice. I want to stop right there. There's four chapters in this letter that Paul wrote to the church at Philippi, and 16 times the word joy or rejoice happens. And so as you read through this letter, uh, I want you to underline, highlight, just to really see that, man, he is imploring, he's encouraging the church with this theme of joy. Verse 5, it says this, Let everyone see that you are considerate in all that you do. Remember the Lord is coming soon. Some translation says the Lord is near. And I want you to know that this morning. In your anxiousness that maybe you're struggling with, I want you to know the Lord is near. Verse 6, it says, Don't worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank Him for what He has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will gall your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. I love what he says here, is that you will experience God's peace and it, it exceeds any of our understanding. And some of us are really struggling with understanding. Why is this going on? Why is this happening? Why is my, uh, my grandparents struggling, uh, staying uh, healthy right now and, and struggling with this virus maybe? Or maybe it's like, why did my spouse, why did they lose their job? And we're just trying to wrestle with all this. And because we're doing a lot of this wrestling without this understanding, man, this anxiousness has risen up in our hearts and in our minds. But he says this, that God's peace, it's going to exceed that understanding. And his peace is going to guard our hearts and our minds. This is a truth that we have to hold on in moments like this. If you were with us last week, uh, I ended the Easter message with something that sounds almost identical, the very words of Jesus in the upper room. And this is what he says in John chapter 14, verse 27. He says this, I am leaving you with a gift. And here's the gift, peace of mind and heart. It's almost the identical words of the apostle Paul. And peace I give to you is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. See, it's with this peace that is a gift that is given to us by God, this gracious God, our Father God, who loves us, who cares for us, even in the midst of health issues or finance issues or educational issues or what is this new norm going to be? Guess what? There is peace for you and for me. For us to understand anxiousness, I want us to give us a working definition that we're going to have over the next four weeks, and I want to read this to you. I have did a lot of study on anxiousness or anxiety. And here's the definition for anxious that we are going to use in this series. And this is what it says, experiencing worry, unease, or nervousness. Any of you experiencing those right now? Worry, check. Unease, check. Nervousness, check. I'm sure every one of us have experienced that. Typically about an imminent event or something with an uncertain outcome. And I think this is what gets us as humans is this lack of control and not knowing the outcome. We are driven by control. We are driven by outcomes. I want to know that A plus B always equals C all the time. And when those equations don't line up, when those numbers don't line up, guess what? We begin to feel anxious. But yet the scripture says that we are to be anxious about nothing. I want you to know we all experience anxiousness, even your pastor. For some of you think, well, you're the pastor. You probably have no fears, no doubts. You've never had anxiousness, depression, any of those things. And I want you to know I'm human. I just told you that I am human. Uh, I have never dealt with anxiety. I've never dealt with depression until this has happened. Over the last five weeks, I've woken up twice in the middle of the night, sweating through my pajamas, and my hands are completely numb. And those are signs of anxiety attacks or panic attacks. And it's something that I am trying to figure out, why am I dealing with this? I, I haven't had any fears about finances. I haven't fears about health issues or our kids. I feel like I'm in a really good place emotionally. I feel like I'm in a good place spiritually. But yet, I think part of it is because of that definition we had earlier that talked about of us not knowing the outcome. And so for me as your pastor, I don't know what the outcome is going to look like. I have no idea. I don't know when we're going to be able to get back in the school and start gathering again. I don't know what uh, ministries we can or can't have because we don't only have so many people together. Uh, right now I'm standing in a room with three people and we're six feet apart. They're behind the cameras. They're way out here in the dark somewhere. So right now it's just me and you in this camera. In the midst of all of this, Paul tells us that we are not to worry or be anxious about anything. 
Well, easier said than done, Paul, because I don't know the outcome, and maybe you don't know the outcome of the situation you are dealing with. So the question is, Paul, how do we deal with this? Before we look at this passage in, in Philippians chapter 4, what I want us to do is take a step back. I want to go look at a prophet in the Old Testament. So open up your Bibles or turn your Bibles back uh, into the Old Testament, into 1 Kings. In 1 Kings, we have this amazing story of the prophet uh, Elijah. And so Elijah is probably the most well-known prophet in the Old Testament, and he has an amazing, amazing story. Now, part of the story I want to share before I read this in chapter 19 is get you up to speed of where we're at in the story. So King Ahab, he was uh, one of the most evil kings back in that time, and for three years he chased uh, Elijah down, trying to kill him. And in chapter 17, there was a drought. And the reason the drought was brought onto the nation of Israel is because of their disobedience. And so there's a drought. And then in verse, or excuse me, in chapter 18, now we have uh, this encounter at Mount Carmel. And so Mount Carmel is a place uh, where this, this encounter between Elijah and the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah. And what happens is, is they uh, have a contest. And in this contest, let me just tell you, this is really cool. I love this. In this contest, they get on on top of this mountain, Mount Carmel. And I want to show you a picture. We're going to bring that up and show that to you here real quick. This is where it takes place uh, right here. So Hannah and I, we were in Israel uh, almost two years ago, and this is where this actual took place. This is Mount Carmel in Israel. Uh, and this is the valley below where the story ends. But on top of this mountain, they have a contest. And so the contest is this. There's 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah against one prophet of God Almighty, Elijah. They have this contest. And Elijah says, this is what I want you to do. I want you to make an altar and we're going to cut a bull in half. You get to pick the bull. We're going to set the bull on top of the altar. And then I want you to pray and cry out to your gods to burn and consume this altar. And then I'll do the same thing. I'm going to put the bull, though not the one that you choose. I'm just going to take the one that's left over. I'm going to cut it in half, put it on this altar, and then I'm going to pray out to my God. And whoever's altar burns up, we know is the one true God. And so all day, those prophets, 850, they're crying out to their gods and crying out and crying out. And guess what? Nothing happens. So it's Elijah's turn. And what does he do? He three times, three different times, what he does is take buckets of water and he has it poured all over the animal, all over the bull, all over the altar. And then he cries out to God and God Almighty, he sends down fire and it consumes the bull. It consumes the wood. It even melts the rock that the altar is built on. And in that moment, he then takes all 850 of those prophets down into this valley and he slays and kills them all. While we were there, there was this statue to commemorate this event. And this is a, a statue of Elijah with a sword. Uh, this is written in various languages that I don't know or understand or read. But basically, it's telling this very story that happens in chapter 18 of 1 Kings. Now, what I'd like to do is then ch uh, look in chapter 19. And this is where we're going to pick this up in Kings and this is what happens after this encounter. And this is what it says. When Ahab got home, he told Jezebel everything Elijah had done, including the way he had killed all the prophets of Baal. So Jezebel sent his message to Elijah. May the gods strike me and even kill me if by this time tomorrow I have not killed you just as you have killed them. Elijah was afraid and fled for his life. And he went to Beersheba, a town in Judah, and he left his servant there. And then he went on alone into the wilderness. Traveling all day, he sat down under a solitary broom tree, and he prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life, for I am no better than my ancestors who have already died. I want you to think about that. How much bravery and courage, and now this man has had enough enough. He's at the end of his rope. Have you had an, enough of people calling you about pile of medical bills? Have you had enough about your old car breaking down time and time again? Have you had enough about your kids arguing over the stupidest things? As my mom would say, enough is enough. Moms, have you gotten to that point that you've said that? I have had enough. Enough is enough. And this is the place where Elijah's at. He has had enough. But how irrational is Elijah right now? Think about it. the story that I just told you. He slayed 850 Baal and Asher prophets. And then one woman, Jezebel, scares him so much that he runs away to Beersheba. 
Now, Mount Carmel to Beersheba is not a short distance. It's 113 miles away. He literally runs four marathons to get away from this woman. It is completely irrational. And guess what? When you're someone who's anxious, it's these irrational things that make us do some really silly things. But in our mind, it's really, really rational. And that's the crazy thing about anxiousness and anxiety. When you're not the person who's anxious, when you're not the person who's in the middle of it and you stand back and you're away from it, you're like, that seems completely irrational. And maybe that's where you are today. What I want to do is, as we look at this passage, I want to look at four things that Elijah does that I believe are mistakes and that I want to encourage us because I think so many times, it's not just important to know what we should do, it's so important to learn what we should not do. And there's four things that he does. Number one is this. The first one, we run ourselves into the ground. And that's what Elijah did at the very beginning. He had this amazing battle. He saw God Almighty consume this altar. He goes down and slays these uh, the prophets, 850 prophets of Baal and Asherah. And then he runs four marathons to get away from this woman. See, anxiousness is not a result of today. It is a result of what comes before. Now, my wife, Hannah, she struggles with anxiety and depression. She's shared her testimony many times. And uh, one of the things she talks about is kind of this bottleneck effect that happens to her. It happens when uh, Hannah has a, a, what we call a, a party plate or a small plate, dinner plate size. We talk about how much can you put on your plate. Like I have this huge plate, like I can put a lot of stuff on my plate at one time, but Hannah has a small dinner plate. And when her plate gets overloaded and overflows, then she has these moments where it just bottlenecks and just kind of erupts. And this is what has happening to Elijah. He has run himself in the ground. I got to reflecting on this and I've never been anxious. I've had these two moments that I shared with you earlier where I've woke up in the middle of the night where I've sweated through my pajamas and my hands were completely numb. And I thought, what am I been doing the last four or five weeks to make myself maybe anxious or my body respond in this way? Well, I want you to know, uh, we got a phone call from the school the day that they were going to close at noon. And they said, Patrick, you and your church need to get all of your stuff out of the Windsor Charter Academy in the next four hours. Do you think I was freaking out a little bit? Yes, I was on the phone. I was calling Caleb and Aaron and Olivia and Carmen. All the staff say, guys, we got to get our trailers. We got to get our stuff. We've got to move fast. <clears throat> the next thing that we've been working on feverishly over the last several weeks is how do we do this? How do we figure out how to live stream? How do we figure out how to not just archive a sermon, but put a whole service together for our church family? We had never done this before. I can't tell you how many Zoom calls I've had over the last five weeks with pastors from all over the country talking about what is going to be next for our church, whether it's a church of our size, a church that is several thousand. Uh, it's just been interesting to hear all the different things that churches and pastors are struggling through to figure out what is going to be next for our church and how do we love and how do we care for the people that God has entrusted us. The other thing that I've been struggling with is preaching to a camera. I just mentioned earlier that there's three people in this room. There's all the lights are out. There's two spotlights on. There's a, a TV screen and there's this camera that I'm looking in. It's one single lens, one eye, and yet there's hundreds of people looking at me and I can't be in the room with you. And as a pastor, I want you to know this makes me anxious. I don't like this. This is not my norm. I don't know the outcome. I don't know how you're reacting. I don't know how you're responding right now. I don't even know if anyone's watching. And so do you think I am a little anxious when I get into this room with all these curtains, these two spotlights, and just me and the camera? I want you to know the answer is yes. I look forward to the day when I get to stand on that stage at the Windsor Charter Academy and your faces are out there and I get to see you. It's going to be like a grandmother that sees that grandkid and wants to pinch your cheeks. I promise I won't touch you or pinch your cheeks because, you know, we'll probably have some regulations when we get back together again. But that's how I feel on the inside. And I desperately want to see you and your families again soon. So some of us, we've been running ourselves into the ground for way too long. Second thing is this, that is we shut people out shut people out. It says he left his servant and he went alone into the wilderness. One of the worst things that you and I can do in moments like this and seasons where we're at, where we're struggling maybe with some anxious thoughts in our mind and our heart is to separate ourselves from one another. How many of you, you've left your spouse or your family, you went to your bedroom or you went into your basement and you binged watch Netflix for eight, 10, 12, 15 hours by yourself? You've shut yourself out and away from others. And I want you to know that is something that you and I, we cannot do. Now, can you binge watch Netflix? Absolutely. But I encourage you to binge watch Netflix with your family. 
How many of our elderly have been locked inside of their homes to protect themselves and for very good reason, and they now literally find themselves in their own wilderness, their own home, prisoners in their home? There's literally hundreds of thousands of millions of elderly in our, in our country who are in a wilderness right now. And so I want to encourage you, if you know any elderly people, whether it's your own uh, parents, your grandparents, or maybe someone in your neighborhood or coworkers, I want you to reach out to them this week and just let them know that they're missed, they're loved, and they are cared for. Here's the warning that uh, Peter gives us. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, he says this. He says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone. Do you see that word? Someone to devour. And what happens is when you separate yourself and you go in your basement or you're locked in your home if you're the elderly all by yourself, Satan has someone to devour. And so I want to encourage you, do not separate yourself. Uh, if you are uh, in quarantine, uh, please use Zoom calls, use FaceTimes. Uh, call a family member to go stand out at the end of the driveway and pull up a chair in your driveway and keep your distance, but have conversations with your neighbors, your friends, your families, and your loved ones. The fourth, or excuse me, the third thing that uh, we need to uh, learn from this passage is that we focus on the negative. We focus on the negative. And it's easy in seasons like this, whether it's health or it's finances, uh, concerns for uh, friends, families, loved ones, we think about the negative. This is what he said. Elijah said that I have had enough. Take my life for I am no better than my ancestors. He went from slaying 850 prophets to take my life. I'm done. Enough is enough. You see, focusing on the negative can bring you down so fast. And I want you to know there is plenty of negativity out there for all of us and then some. How much time are you spending on Facebook right now, reading every article and reading every um, news clip? It's just out there, all the stuff. I, read, I see these articles and it says the coronavirus is ending or it's going to be longer and it's just, it is over and over and over and it is so difficult. How many hours of the week are you watching the news? You want to get sucked into negativity, you turn on the news and you watch any, any half-hour news program and you will be sucked down. How often are you watching the John Hopkins map of all the red dots spreading in the U.S.? You end up a full-blown panic attack. You look at that screen and it goes crazy. Don't do that to yourself because this only creates neg negativity. We can spiral downhill when we focus on the negativity. So we need to renew our minds. That's what the Apostle Paul wrote. In uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, he says this. Don't be conformed to this world. The world was going to tell you, watch social media, watch the news, read everything, be educated. And yes, be informed. I'm not saying that. Be informed. I read a couple of headlines every day. I know what's going on, but I don't get sucked into it because this is bad for my heart and my mind. It says this, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind. How are you renewing your mind every day? That by testing that you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and is acceptable and perfect. Church, listen to me. You need to renew your mind. One of the greatest ways for you to renew your mind is spending time in God's Word. This week, this is what I want you to do. I want you to read the whole book of Philippians. It's four chapters of joy and encouragement that the Apostle Paul wrote to this church that he loves and adore, adores. And listen to me, I love and adore this church. And I want to I want to help you in finding your joy that is found in Christ. And I want to encourage you because some of you, you need some encouragement right now like you've never needed it before because I hear those pains and I hear those hurts. I'm getting those phone calls. I'm getting those text messages. I know what's going on in your life. And so you need to renew your mind. The fourth thing that we see is sometimes we forget God. This is the fourth thing. And that's what happened to Elijah. He forgot God. Elijah's life, he saw in God, the presence of God was real. His provision was real and his power was certain. He burned up an altar. He called out to God and said, okay, God, these guys their God is not the real true God, but my God is. And I want to prove it so much that I'm going to dump buckets of water, not just one bucket or twice or three. That's, I'm just going to fill it up. I'm going to coat it. It's soaked in water. Now I'm going to call on the name of the Lord. And guess what? I'm going to watch you consume this altar, the bull and the wood and even the rocks that it was on into absolutely nothing. Elijah did what many of us do. We focus on our problems and we forget God. Because we've lost our job, because um, of health issues, we are so focused on these other things that we have, we've left God behind like Elijah. And I want you to know that God is with you. He is for you. He is literally next to you. 
And our focus and our heart and mind needs to be focused on him, even as we face our problems. Yes, we need to face our problems. If you have lost your job, you need to file for unemployment. You need to start looking for a new job. All those things you're doing, but you cannot do it without God. Elijah's name in the Hebrew means my God is Yahweh, literally means breath. And yet we can't live without the breath of God. How many of you are facing problems of unemployment I looked at the numbers this week. There's been over 17 million people who have filed for unemployment as of last week. How many of you are facing the problems of helping your kids with online school? I've had to be a teacher a couple of times now, and there's some things that my 14-year-old and my 16-year-old, they are so much smarter than their dad will ever be. And yet there's questions that we're trying to figure out. How do we help our kids find the answers to some of these questions? Are you facing problems of keeping a safe distance Some of you are essential workers and you're on the front lines, whether you're doctors or nurses uh, or you're working at some retail stores that are still open and you are literally on the front lines. And so this is something that you are facing each and every day. And in the midst of whatever you're dealing with, I want you to know you cannot, cannot forget God. Elijah did this and I don't want you to make the same mistake. So the question begs, and how did God help Elijah in his time of need? If you look a, a little further in the story, and this is what it says in 1 Kings chapter 19, 11 and 12. It says, go out and stand before me on the mountain, the Lord told him. And as Elijah stood there, the Lord passed by and a mighty windstorm hit the mountain. It was such a terrible blast that the rocks were torn loose, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake earthquake. And after the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, there was a sound of a gentle whisper. Right now, many of us, you are facing a windstorm. Some of you are facing an earthquake. Some of you are facing a fire. And because of that, you have this anxiousness. God sometimes is not in the windstorm. Sometimes he's not in the earthquake. Sometimes he's not in the fire. Sometimes he's right here. He's in the gentle whisper. You see, God revealed himself in a whisper. And God whispers because he's close to you. I want you to think about that for the moment. If you whisper in someone's ear, you draw really close to them, right by their ear, and you whisper to them, I'm right here with you. I love you. I'm not going to leave you or forsake you. Those are the words that you need to hear this morning, but because of the windstorm, because of the earthquake, because of the fire, and because sometimes we leave God behind because we're so focused on our problems, we can hear the whisper of God. You see, Elijah was afraid of losing his life, not to King Ahab, but to a woman, the wife of King Ahab, Jezebel. One woman scared this man who just slayed 850 prophets. And then he ran all the way to Beersheba, 113 miles, four marathons. And at the very end, what does he say? I have had enough. Enough is enough, God. I'm done. I want to take my own life. But I want you to know, this is not how the story ends. In in 2 Kings chapter 2, Elijah, he's walking with his protege, Elijah. And they're walking from Jericho to the Jordan River. And as they're walking, this, this chariot of fire comes right in between these two men. And it actually sweeps up Elijah and it takes him into heaven. And the thing that he was the most anxious about, being killed by one woman, he never, ever encountered. He didn't experience an earthly death. He was taken alive into heaven And then Elisha became the new prophet or the voice for the kingdom of Israel. Now, most of the time, the things that we worry about, did you know that they never happen? I find it interesting in our humanness, because of these windstorms and earthquakes and fires that are around us, we turn them, these little bitty hills, sometimes into mountains that we feel like they cannot be overcome. I want you to know if you're anxious about your finances, most likely you are not going to file bankruptcy and you are going to find a new job or get your old job back. If you're anxious about homeschooling your kids, I'm really confident that our kids are going to go back to school in the fall. If you're anxious about getting COVID-19, as of this week, less than 1% of Americans have contracted the virus. But you're saying, Patrick, but, but what, if, what if I don't get my job back or what if I do get the virus I want you to know God's still going to whisper in your ear and he's not going to leave you or forsake you. He is with you always. And it's in these moments that shapes our faith like nothing else. 
These are, these are faith shapers. And I believe God, um, he's allowed this to happen. And I believe this, this season in our culture is happening because God wants to call his people back to him and say, I want you to trust me. Not the things of this earth, because there's no peace in your job. There's no peace in your health. There's no peace in anything else. There's place, one place where peace is found, and it is found in God. So what is our response when we've had enough? When you feel like, maybe you're like Elijah, and you feel like, God, I've had enough. And I've done some of these things that Elijah did. I distanced myself from people. I didn't involve God in my problems as I'm facing them. Um, maybe you're running from a crazy wild woman named Jezebel. I don't know, but there are things that, uh, that you are looking at and you're trying to figure out. And, and I don't want you to respond like Elijah. I want you to respond how the Apostle Paul encouraged the church at Philippi. And I want to go back to that passage in Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. And I want to remind you that Paul, when he wrote this letter, he's in chains and he's being ready to be sentenced, trying to find out his verdict. Is he innocent or guilty? And I'm pretty sure there were some anxious thoughts maybe in his mind and heart. And this is what he says. He says, don't worry about anything. Some translations say, don't be anxious about anything. Instead, this is what we've been called to do, and I want to challenge you today, is pray about everything. Are you praying about everything? Not some things, not just your job that you need or, or the health and protection of those you love, but are you praying about everything? Here's what he says. Tell God what you need and thank him for all that he has done. There's two things that he says. Tell God what you need. God, I need a job. <laughs> I need insurance because I have some, some kids to take care of and a wife or a husband, and so we need insurance. We need that. But I want you to spend time this week thanking God for what he has already done. You do these two things, this is the result. Then you will experience God's peace doesn't say you experience peace when you're reading all those Facebook posts. You know, I experience peace when you're watching the news every half hour at the top of the hour. You're going to experience God's peace when you are a person of prayer. He goes on to say this, which exceeds anything that we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. As we close today, I'm going to ask you to do these two following things. Number one is this. Directly after the service, I want you to make a two list. Two list. First one is I want you to write down, God, what do I need? And I want you to pray and tell God, this is what I need. And the second thing is I want you to make a list and I want you to thank God for everything that he has done. He's died so that you could have eternal life. He's a good and gracious God that you can live under his kingship, under his authority, as adopted into the family of God and know that there's peace in that no matter what happens and so directly after the service, what I want you to do is write those two lists and I want you to pray with your family. Whether you're sitting on your couch right now or maybe you're sitting at your kitchen table, maybe you're in your office and you're watching this online by yourself, wherever you are at directly after the service, I want you to do that. Thursday night, our church, we have a Zoom call and that is what we're gonna pray this coming Thursday night. We're gonna pray about these two things and you can join us. We'll send the link out via email and through our social media outlets and we want you to pray I find it interesting. It's in times like this. This is the time when we, we have trouble praying. I don't know if it's pride. I don't know if it's fear, but I think this is a time for us to cry out and say, God, I need your help. And this is what I help, uh, what I need help with. And God, I want to spend time thanking you for what you have done. And so if you begin to step into praying like Paul did, I want you to know you're going to experience this peace, which is going to exceed all understanding. Because as we looked earlier, that definition of uh, anxiousness, that it's experiencing worry or unease or nervousness, typically about an imminent event or something that is an uncertain outcome. For most of us, there's a lot of uncertain outcomes. How are we going to do church in the future? What is my new work going to look like? Am I going to have to move? Am I going to sell my house? Can I sell my house? Are my kids going to go back to school? Is my parents and grandparents, are they going to be safe, not just in the next few weeks and months, but in a year from now? And so we don't know the outcomes, but here's what I do know. God knows the outcomes. And he is a good God. He is a gracious God. He is a loving God. He is a holy God. And he is a just God. And he knows what's best for you. Church, I want to encourage us with this sermon series as we look at what the Apostle Paul says, and I want us to be a church that we are anxious about nothing. Let's pray. Lord God, um, we are grateful for today. I'm grateful for this season, God. That's hard to pray. Paul said that we need to rejoice in all things. And Lord, so I just want to, I want to pray and say thank you for this season. 
I'm not going to say thank you for this virus, God, but we're thankful you for the season. You're teaching us some things, and I want us to be uh, graceful and flexible and willing to step into some things that maybe you've never taken us in and through, God, because I know it's in these moments like this that you are going to show your, your might and your power and your grace and your mercies that are new every morning, God. And so I pray for us, that for us to walk faithfully in this season with you, not without you, as we face these problems, as we face these challenges, as we face the windstorms, as we face the earthquakes, as we face the fire, God, would you, would you calm and still our minds and our hearts so you can whisper into our ears? God, the only way that you're going to whisper into our ears is if we seek you in prayer. And Lord, I, I want us to do this today, God, with our families, with our friends, wherever we're at, Lord, that we would stop right now after this service is done, that we would ask you and seek you and say, God, this is what I need. And God, I want to spend time thanking you. And Lord, I know this is going to change our mind and our heart. It is going to renew us. It's going to transform us. It's because we're seeking you and your wisdom and not the wisdom of this world. Because true peace is found nowhere in this world. True peace is found in you and you alone. Lord, we're so grateful for today. We're thankful for this series as we walk together, as we talk about anxiousness and how do we combat it, Lord, because I believe it's a, it's a, it's a natural human thing that we all struggle with at some level, whether it's for the first time or maybe someone's been struggling their whole life, God, and we don't want to walk in anxiousness anymore. We want to walk in faithfulness because we know who you are and what you have done. Lord, we love you and we trust you. It's in the mighty, it's in the powerful name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Now we're going to go into a time of communion, and uh, I'm going to pray for that. And I really want you to think about that. The two things I asked you to pray about earlier um, in this message was, number one is tell God what you need, but the second thing is to thank Him. And I want you to spend time with your family right now as you take the bread and you take the cup that represents His broken body and His shed blood for you. It's through this atonement that you and I can have eternal life, that we can have this forgiveness of sins. And I want you to spend some these next few moments, praying and thanking God for what he has done on the cross for you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we pause again and we come with thankful hearts right now. In the midst of our storms, in the midst of our earthquakes, in the midst of our fires, God, we just want to pause and say thank you. Thank you that you would send your one and only son, that he would wrap himself in flesh, live on this earth for 33 years and endure the most painful death of all time. And he did it because he wanted to be number one, obedient and faithful to you, but he did it out of love for us, God. He knew that the only way that man could be renewed, restored, redeemed, and put into a right relationship with God the Father was through this perfect sacrifice of himself. And so, Lord, he, he did this out of love. He did it out of obedience. And Lord, we just want to pause and say thank you for that. So, Lord, we, we pause now and we say thank you from the bottom of our hearts. We love you and trust you in Christ's name. Amen. Hey church, wasn't that a great message from Patrick this morning? Anxious for nothing. I, I find myself dealing with anxiety a lot and I'll tell you more about that in a couple of weeks. But for now, it is so, so important for us to ask God for what we need and thank him for what he has done. With that, I wanna close our service today with a few announcements for you. Uh, the first one is obviously uh, we wanna talk about giving. Your giving has made our church have a tremendous impact on the community around us. And I want you to remind you there's two ways that you can give. One is through our website and one is through the Church Center app. And you can set that up. You can set it up to be automatic every month, every couple weeks, whatever you want to do there. And it has helped fund a tremendous amount of ministry in our community. In fact, right here in this very ice house, we have what's going on as far as the food pantry goes. 
It happens every day, Monday through Friday from 4 to 6 p.m. You can send any of your friends, family members, acquaintances, even random people you've met. If they have a need, we would like to serve them. We're partnered up with four other churches in the community here, and uh, every night of the week a different church comes, and they're here to serve the community and pass out um, these goods that, that have been donated to us and that we've been able to invest in to help out the community during this pandemic. So please um, make sure that you get the word out. Uh, we've tried to do as good of a job as we can on social media, but we need your help. So we look forward to uh, having you spread the word. Last but not least, again, we've been talking about this since we went online, but our social media calendar, uh, it's super exciting week again that we just had this past week, but Monday nights, children's nights with Olivia. She does a fantastic job with our kids. Tuesday night is family game night, I think is what we're gonna officially call it now on a Zoom call. Always a great time for some laughs. Wednesday night is our devotional night, and uh, you'll see that either from Patrick or Caleb. Uh, Patrick did one this past week, it was really dark, so I hope you enjoyed that devotional from him and that dark background, it was great. Uh, Thursday nights is our prayer night. You heard Patrick mention that during his sermon. This week we are going to pray that prayer that Paul tells us in Philippians. We need to ask God for what we need, and we need to thank him for all he has done. That'll happen Thursday night. And then finally, Friday is student ministry night. So Carmen and I will host a Zoom call again this Friday or this upcoming Friday. And uh, we look forward to speaking with your students and connecting with them during this time. All right, with that, I hope you guys have a, a great rest of your week as we start a new one from home. Enjoy all that uh, student teaching that you have at home, all you homeschool teachers, myself included. And thank you for joining us today. Have a great week.